Adam, first of all, I'd like to uh, thank you for taking the time to join. Uh, there are a lot of speaker sessions at this event, and um, it kind of intimidates you because there's so many different sessions going on. I really appreciate all of you taking the time. Uh, I also want to thank the event organizers for giving me this opportunity to speak to you. Um, and I want to apologize for not having a sexier title. It's a pretty generic title. Um, just wanted to talk about how we can secure data um, stored in the cloud. And two specific uh, solutions that I want to talk about today is a perimeter-based uh, web security solution and database encryption, uh, both of which we offer. Um, by the way, my name is Jason Yu. I'm the Senior Vice President of Business Development uh, for Pinterest Security Systems. And uh, we'll uh, start now. I wanted to talk a little bit about the current cybersecurity landscape. Uh, in my line of business, we work with a lot of enterprises. Uh, we also work with web hosting companies. But I also have the privilege of visiting a lot of different uh, data centers, including cloud data centers. And there's always two different items that are always highlighted. Uh, one is the cooling. And the cooling is they always show you how you know the data center is cool. And another thing is uh, the amount of effort they put into uh, the physical security in terms of access. You know, you need to have your thumbprints or you know, like all of these different codes to be able to actually physically access the data centers and, and the web servers and the customers that are in in there. Um, but one of the interesting conversations that I always have with these individuals um, is uh, most of their customers are, are offering web services. So even though it's physically very difficult to access all of the data centers, if the customers are doing any sort of business on the internet, which most businesses do nowadays, it essentially means a, a, a backdoor that's wide open. One of the things that we're trying to change is this kind of physical security mindset. One of the interesting questions to me uh, going forward as we go into all of these different wonderful things like IoT and big data and all of these things is that everyone is providing the infrastructure and everyone is providing the walls and all of the different scanning items to make sure that everything within the wall stays clean as possible. But one of the interesting questions to me is, who is going to be responsible for the traffic that visits in and out of that infrastructure? And uh, that's kind of the things, that's one of the things that I really want to um, talk to you about. According to Gardner, by 2018, there's going to be a 50% decrease in using network firewalls to protect web application attacks. Um, I think this is a very conservative estimate because network firewalls really don't have much to do with what we come to know as the web application or the OSI 7. They don't know how to do it. It's, it's essentially um, network firewalls are essentially dealing with attacks that I've already uh, incurred inside the infrastructure. So another way of putting that is attacks that have already happened. So our proposition is that security should, be, should not be reactive, but proactive, and shift to the perimeter. The dilemma of the internet gets amplified in the cloud, and IoT gets amplified even more. So for cloud environments, data is created, stored, and managed online. But who is protecting it, and how is it being protected? Um, protecting the perimeter, perimeter, I think, is going to be essential. I'm going to be using that word a lot because by perimeter, what I mean is at the very outer edge so that we can block most of the attacks before they can come into the infrastructure altogether. And because we're using mostly network technology, most companies, most data centers, most web hosting companies, we're using network security solutions to protect themselves. Um, it's only natural that, according to Gartner, 75% of all attacks happen on their uh, web application. Um, hackers know that that's the point of vulnerability. And that's, going back to the physical security mindset, if there's that one little back door that opens up to the OS 7 that's going to be a major source of vulnerability. Um, another thing I wanted to talk to you about is 54% of all attacks last year focused on data breach and identity. Now, from someone who's in IT security, we hear this all the time, no, no customer does anything until they get hacked. The inference behind that 
common statement that we so often use is that no one's going to do anything until you see a type of attack that's just going to bring the website down, which you, you can physically see. But if you look at the advanced uh, web attacks that are happening all over the world, it's actually the attack attackers that kind of hide out in your web server or your network and then gain administrative access. But those are the ones that can do the really serious um, damage in terms of data breach and identity. So um, I think we as an industry need to kind of change our thinking into not only focusing on attacks that we can see, but also the ones that we cannot. So enough uh, fear stuff. Um, so how do we protect ourselves? Um, the cloud fallacy is the very nature of the internet is, is to be open. The more open it is, the better, because that allows more legitimate users to be able to get in there and use all of the wonderful web applications and web services that enterprises and customers offer. But so closing that to a point where you're going to block out the legitimate users is really not an option. Um, so I, th I think it's really, we're in a state, I think when you're in a reactive state of mind and there's a vulnerability, the first instinct is to build bigger walls. Uh, but what we think is don't build bigger walls. You have to keep it open. Just be smarter about having a stronger gate. And the thing that is specifically applicable to that kind of thinking is the web application firewall. The web application firewall just monitors and filters all malicious HTTPS and HTTP traffic that's coming in through the website. So that's just a fancy way of saying the back door that opens out into the internet is just inspecting all of the traffic that's going in and out. Um, it stops attacks on web intruders before they can enter your network. The, the logic of this is that if you can block it at the network, they'll never be able to get into the network in, into the first place. So eliminate as much of the attacks as possible, while also letting in as many of the legitimate users as possible. But hackers still get through. The really talented hackers can get through, and especially with the attacks that you can't see that I mentioned before. Um, you know, they're going to what they're really aiming for is the data at the back end database. So in order to secure yourself at the second layer, we think that a database encryption technology is essential because if you encrypt your most sensitive data and it somehow gets stolen by a remote attacker, and remember at the backend DB level, it could also be insider threats as well. Um, having it encrypted makes the data that they steal useless. So I'm going to talk uh, about the web application firewall first. So as you can see here, the web application firewall is just the last gateway. If you want to think of it as a toll booth, if you want to think of it as a bouncer at a club, it really doesn't matter. It's just the guy that's guarding your door that gets inside your network. So if the good visitors come in, that's all we want. If it's going to be spammers, DDoS, hackers, crawlers, and bots, these are all the threats that we face today. We want to be able to eliminate as many of these as possible. The benefits of WAFs are um, multiple. It's a cleaner and safer network. As I mentioned before, we're trying to block as many of the attacks as possible at the perimeter. Um, and you can really, it's, it's been, that our experience uh, has been wonderful in showing customers that we're eliminating a lot of the attacks before they can come into the uh, network altogether. Um, it also provides a safe uh, peace of mind because we're blocking, again, from the outside. But of course, security is meaningless unless it gives you performance. So as many of the attacks as you're blocking, you also need to let in as many legitimate users as possible. So if we have a web security solution that slows down your web performance or stops it altogether, that's going to be a major sore spot, spot for customer jobs. And also, it's uh, built for uh, PCI DSS um, compliance. Now, hardware versus service loss. Uh, according to Gartner, by 2020, 60% of web applications will be protected by cloud service loss. This is a natural transition, I think. Uh, we've been in the hardware business for 11 years. Uh, we developed a cloud software about four years ago. 
the only problem is that with these solutions, it's very expensive to buy appliances. And even if, when we provided the cloud software, I, we had to train either our partners or their customers to be able to run all of this. Now, there are a lot of network engineers out there in the world. There aren't as many application engineers out there uh, at, at this point. So to be able to take a network engineer and to get them trained and, and familiar with the web layer is actually a lot of work. It usually takes at least three or four days of training for us. So it's a very difficult and it, it limits the, the market. So what we did was we're now providing it as a service. So we give you a virtual machine on the cloud software and then we monitor all the traffic that's coming in. If we need to blacklist, if we need to whitelist, we'll provide all of those services for you. And we believe that the trends are going this way with our better. Uh, so now we have an understanding of how web application firewalls work. Um, I want to talk a little bit about choosing the right WAF. Um, the WAF market is going to explode, and, and this is something that is, uh, you know, effective at a lot of different for a lot of different people. Because at the very least, if you can block even a small amount of, of attacks, but still maintain uh, the web performance that you had before, then that's a win-win situation. Um, you want to be able to block as many attacks as possible, but uh, you know we really uh, choosing the WAF that's going to give you the balance of blocking as many attacks as possible, but allowing as many legitimate uh, access as possible. That's going to be key in the future. So what's the criteria? Accurate detection rates. Um, that that relates to false positive detection. So. Let's say that there, we do a test and we send in a hundred different attack patterns into the web server. You, of course, you want to be able to block as many of those as possible, but the ones that you deem to be a web attack really needs to be a web attack because if it's a legitimate user that's being blocked, that's actually um, marginalizing the amount of business that the customer can do. Um, and so, you know, false positive detection we think is very good. So it's not, important to just you know uh, monitor as many attacks as possible and say we, we blocked all of these attacks. So out of all the attacks that you've blocked, it's very imperative that you've accurately detected the web attacks. Ease of deployment and management is very key and that's what why we turned it into a service. And also pricing is very important. Um, and because we've turned it into a service we can offer to customers at a at a lower price than the hardware. Because remember, it's not just the cost of implementation, it's also the cost of having someone in your organization that can handle this. Um, but like I mentioned before, um, you can't block every attack because there's this balance of you have to let in as many of the legitimate users as possible. So you're just having this balance and a really uh, heavily targeted attack is going to aim, aim for your backend data. Um, and so what is database encryption? It's just using complex algorithms to be able to make it, make the data stolen useless, as, as useless as possible for, for the person who's uh, stealing it. Um, now why encrypt data? I, I, I'll be the first one to admit to all of you that you know, encryption is largely compliance driven. You know, so for us, we get a lot of uh, requests from the healthcare industry they have the HIPAA regulations they need. And uh, you know, we have uh, educational institutions that need to protect their students' privacy in all of these different areas. Um, but it reduces the sensitive data leakage. Um, and encrypted data can never be exploited you know, according to the uh, identity of the resources. The benefits is the protection of data is complete. Uh, if you encrypt the data, it's scrambled. It guarantees data integrity, so you can it should be able to easily detect whether the data was was manipulated or tampered. And as I mentioned before, this is largely contained with compliance track. So choosing the right database encryptions. There's so many options out there right now. Um, the database encryption market is expected to grow, uh, you know, by 20 by almost 30 percent through 2020, and that's largely due to the increase in cloud adoption. 
when you're choosing the right database encryption for you, it should support a variety of database environments, including open source DBs. I don't know how many of you work with MySQL or GraalDB, for example, um, but you know they release new uh, products all the time. So uh, you know when we have customers ask us for a version that they want supported, we either ask them to downgrade or upgrade to the latest, or you know in some cases we build a customized solution for that. It should also provide access control and DB audit standards. This is a lot of compliance-driven stuff, but it's very important. It's not only important to encrypt data, but you, as an organization, need to determine who's going to have access to encrypt or decrypt that data. Right? It only makes sense. So you can encrypt by, uh, you can control that access by IP address, for example. There are a variety of different ways of doing that. And also DB audits. When was this encrypted? When was this decrypted? All of this is to be able to leave a record for the compliance requirements. Now, we provide column level encryption. Uh, I don't know if you've ever heard of column level encryption, but instead of encrypting the entire table, it doesn't make any sense for us to be able to encrypt the entire table. We just want to select the column that has the most sensitive data that's essential for you to protect. Now, there are two benefits to this. We minimize the latency of the DB performance because we're not encrypting the entire thing. And also, the organization could continue to work with the unencrypted data for those who don't have access control, you know, uh, access to the encryption or decryption privileges. We also provide engine level support for faster performance. Um, it also, this also allows for faster implementation because there's no application coding modifications that's necessary as well. And secure key management is becoming an issue. It's something we provide as well. So key management is if you, uh, by default, if you get our product, the encryption decryption key is encrypted itself and stored within the engine. So there's a small risk that somebody could steal that key, decrypt it, and then they'll have access to the entire database. We have a um, key management appliance that allows you to store the, the encryption decryption keys in a separate physical location to make it that much more difficult to have the key that's essential to encrypt or decrypt. Now, uh, our company logo, logo is uh, Trust for an Open Society. Uh, I'm American, you know, so I see I'm, I'm kind of monitoring the elections right now, and I think. When I see you know, Donald Trump, like he's just all about building the walls, I really don't think that's the way to go forward because all of these things that we're talking about here this week, you know, uh, uh, cloud, IoT, like big data, all of these different items, makes it essential that we need to be able to communicate with different um, organizations. With IoT, with all of these everyday devices, that's, that's all gonna run on the internet layer. It needs to be open, but we need to have it open, but able to have something, a solution that's going to be allow us to communicate with trust with one another. Now, of course, you can't communicate with trust to all organizations, but the ones that are relevant to you, your customers, for example, it's essential that they be able to have the trust um, to be able to do their business online and you know, for your brand reputation and all of the different items. So we think that uh, you know, having a great perimeter-based detection solution that's not going to compromise your web performance, and to have a second layer security solution that's going to make protect the data through encryption and key management is going to be key. And by doing so, I think we can foster trust and we can move on to all of these great items uh, you know, that, that we're going to see in the future from the cloud. Um, that's it for me. Uh, thank you very much for your time. I'd be more than happy to uh, take questions. Now, I've been told that this is an open space, so he's going to come around with the mic. So if you have any questions, I'd love to take them. this in Europe. You know, Asians don't ask questions, but Europeans ask uh, tons of questions. Um, so no questions? Oh. Uh, you, hello. Hello. Um, you mentioned the fact that uh, the key is used to uh, encrypt the database or store the separate application. How are those effective? Uh, we have a, a we've been integrated with a 
variety of different HSM uh, vendors, so that's an option to be able to um, comply with FIPS uh, requirements. Um, but really, it's, it's just a matter of hiding the key management server in a remote location so that nobody can access it. So it's like access control, but taking it a step further by really restricting the access that, that people have to be able to decrypt the data. You know, that's the only hardware solution I'm talking to you guys about today. Um, so hardware solutions, so anytime we sell any hardware, uh, we very, very strongly recommend a high availability setup. Um, not to increase the amount of speed, because you don't need that for the key management solutions, but to have a backup hardware that's going to go on um, and function and, and replace uh, any hardware failures that's going to happen. Very much for your time. Uh, we're just down the down the hall. Uh, we have a lot of uh, people here, so if you uh, want to ask any more questions and find out more, uh, please do so. I'd love to talk to any of you if you want to just seek me out uh, and have a conversation about uh, the items that I talked about today. Thank you very much. Have a great week.